My name is Jan Hünschel. I'm the chair of this session, of this tutorial, and I would like to welcome you to the IEDM 2021 in person here in San Francisco. And I'm glad that I would like to introduce you Dong So Pli. He will give you this, this tutorial about gallium nitride power te device technology and reliability tutorial. Dong Su Bli is a semiconductor technologist. He is currently working at Texas Instruments and he joined Texas Instruments uh, in 2014 and works uh, more uh, or since then on the 600 volt gallium nitride technology development and the reliability improvements as well as the successful qualification and productization of those technologies for their products. He received an electrical engineering degree uh, from the National University in so Seoul, Korea, and he holds a PhD from the MIT, which he completed in 2014. His researches are various, main field is in the, of course, the semiconductor devices, but also a CMOS, advanced CMOS and tunneling FETs. And he is author of numerous papers and also an, uh, served several technical communities uh, and conferences as a technical member. So welcome you and uh, looking forward to your talk. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's uh, hello everyone, uh, welcome to IDM tutorial, GAN Power Device Technology and Reliability. Uh, my name is Dong Seop Lee from Texas Instrument. And before starting this tutorial, I would like to first uh, thank IDM committee for giving me this opportunity. So today, I have uh, three goals. Uh, first, I would like to provide a general overview of uh, gallium nitride power devices for people who are not familiar with this technology and then we'll review the key reliability topics in this device. Uh, it's a relatively new technology, understanding potential reliability issues and developing innovative solutions are very critical for successful technology qualification and commercialization. And finally, we'll review the, the recent progress of this technology, which can give us some idea how the future Gantt electronics will look like. So this is the outline of my talk. So after a brief introduction on the gallium nitride and its benefits, uh, we'll first cover the basics of the GAN devices, uh, including the GAN EPI, uh, device structure and device operation. And then based on that background, uh, we'll see the, what kinds of potential reliability issues can happen in this device. So we'll start with the uh, intrinsic device level and move to the application level reliability. And lastly, uh, we'll review the recent innovations which can push the GAN electronics to the next level. So let's start. So why should we use uh, gallium nitride? Uh, we can first check the benefits of the gallium nitride in the point of material properties. So if you see the right table, uh, it's a wide band gas semiconductor with a high critical electric field. It's uh, about 10 times higher than silicon. And also electron mobility is also quite high. And this combination, high critical electric field and high electron mobility, uh, makes this material very promising for high power or high frequency devices. And in addition to the excellent electrical properties, the thermal conductivity of the gallium nitride is as good as the silicon, which is also very important for devices handling high power. And manufacturability and cost are always the main concern for new devices uh, and new materials. But thanks to the success of the LED industry, uh, these concerns are much less in gallium nitride, and the cost gap between the gallium nitride and silicon is continuously decreasing, thanks to wafer scaling. And how these uh, benefits uh, can be reflected to the actual device performance? Uh, to help your understanding, I put simple circuit model for power device. So in addition to the device DC resistance, there are a couple of important AC parameters for power devices. For example, the input capacitance uh, CG, up capacitance COSS, and also reverse recovery charge QRR. And first, thanks to the high critical electric field, GAN device can support the higher voltage with a smaller device dimension. And with a combination of a high electron mobility, the smaller device dimension reduces the on resistance, which is helpful for conduction loss reduction. And also the input and output capacitances 
are scaled with the overall device size and also uh, with the RSP. Uh, this is because uh, we, we can reduce the total device width to meet the same RDS zone. So low input and capacitances uh, reduce the switching loss and also make it possible to operate this device at higher frequency. And also, different from conventional silicon power devices, there is no body diode in gallium nitride. So there is no reverse recovery loss associated with the body diode, and it reduces the ringing in the switching node, and also opens up a possibility for new circuit topologies. So thanks to all these benefits, gallium nitride technology can take a multi-kilowatt power to previously unachievable frequency range and power density. So if you see this figure, uh, it shows the potential gain market in power and frequency domain. And it's intersecting the emerging multi-billion dollar market for electrification of uh, non-traditional applications, such as the grid infrastructure and the automotive. And this uh, uh, is uh, one example to show the benefit in the, of the gallium nitride technology in power supply design. So it's an end-to-end -end power conversion from the AC power line to the point of load. So in the first stage, the two-temple PFC can provide more than 99% uh, efficiency with about three times higher power density than conventional silicon solutions. And also the following LLC and the single-stage converter also outperform the silicon solutions by far in terms of frequency and power density. So as you can see in this example, the GAN technology can uh, push the performance of the power system significantly, uh, which drives the fast and the widespread market adoption. So this is from the, this year's Yields report. So the GAN market in 2020 uh, was expanded by about two times compared to the 2019. And the main market penetration has started in consumer electronics, such as uh, laptop or smartphone chargers. And also the adoption in other areas, uh, such as the data uh, center, telecom, and ultimately automotive, is expected to grow continuously, as you can see in the projection. So there was a very high level overview of uh, gallium nature technology. And now we're going to zoom in and try to understand the basics of the gallium device. So we can start with the crystal structure. So the gallium nitride crystal structure is uh, uh, oxides. And as you can see in this uh, left figure, the gallium and nitrogen atoms are uh, arranged in a closely spaced hexagonal bilayers. If the gallium is on top of the bilayer, it is called as a gallium phase. If nitrogen is, the, is at the top, it is called as a nitrogen phase. And typically, the gallium phase is mainly used for power devices because it's much easier to grow and process. And one of the unique characteristics uh, in gallium nitride is uh, polarization. So gallium and nitrogen atoms form ionic bonding, and the shared electrons in the bonding are asymmetrically distributed because of the large difference in the electron negativity between the gallium and nitrogen, as you can see in the polling scale table. And this, since this ultra crystal structure does not have an inversion symmetry, the asymmetric charge distribution in each bonding does not cancel out and forms a net polarization field. In the gallium phase, the polarization field direction is a downward. In the nitrogen phase, it's upward direction. And this polarization field plays a very important role in GAN device, and we're going to see uh, in the, after a few slides. So if you see the actual FE structure used for high voltage power devices, it has uh, multiple layers. So if you start with uh, from the bottom, first we need a substrate. So if you have a pure gallium nitride substrate, it's much easier to grow high quality thick gallium nitride. But unfortunately, there are still many technical challenges to grow the high quality and large scale gallium nitride uh, substrate with low cost. So people uh, typically use the uh, foreign substrate, such as uh, silicon, sapphire, or silicon carbide. And silicon is the most uh, popular choice, especially for power devices, because of uh, its low cost and the uh, scalability. But we cannot grow the high quality gallium nitride directly on top of the silicon substrate because there is a relatively large lattice constant mismatch. So if you see this center figure, uh, there is about 15% lattice constant mismatches between the silicon and the gallium nitride. And also there is a relatively large difference in the thermal expansion coefficient. So to grow the gallium nitride on top of the silicon substrate, we first need to put the aluminum nitride nucleation layer as a foundation, and also need, we need to put a relatively thick buffer. So there are two main roles of these buffer layers. Uh, first, 
uh, it reduces the impact of the mismatch of the lattice constant and the summer mismatch. And also, it blocks the high voltage in the vertical direction. So in terms of the buffer layer design, there are two main types. The first one is a step-graded argon buffer. So on top of the aluminum nitride, we start with a higher aluminum percent argon layer and gradually reduce the aluminum percent uh, through multiple steps so that we can reach the gallium nitride. Another option is a super lattice, uh, which alternates the aluminum nitride and gallium nitride, or aluminum nitride and aluminum gallium nitride. So once the buffer growth is done, the next step is the back barrier. The purpose of the back barrier is to suppress the vertical or lateral leakage current. So if you grow the gallium nitride without any doping, the gallium nitride tends to become weak anti. Uh, this is because the silicon or oxygen which are present in the epichamber are good anti dopants for gallium nitride. So if you grow just the uh, undoped gallium nitride, the Fermi level is closer to the, close to the firm, uh, conduction band. So under high uh, voltage stress, the electron, electrons in the channel can spill over to the buffer and cause a large lateral or vertical leakage current. So to compensate the anti dopant effect, the carbon is mainly used as a deep acceptor. So if you dope the back barrier with the carbon, now the Fermi level is pinned at the carbon level, which is about 0.7 eV from the balance band. So as you can see in this figure, the entire band is raised, uh, which can provide a better charge confinement so it can reduce the vertical and lateral leakage current. Um, because of the similar reason, we also use the carbon as a, for the buffer doping. It reduces the background carrier density by compensating the anti dopants in the, back, in the buffer layers. So if you see the, this center figure, with the increasing the carbon level in the buffer, we can effectively suppress the vertical leakage current across the buffer layers. But in spite of this uh, benefit, uh, we cannot keep increasing the carbon level in the uh, back barrier or the buffer layer because uh, first, if, if you increase the carbon level too much, it, reduce, uh, it degrades the crystal quality of the gallium nitride. And also, if the highly doped carbon layer is too close to the channel, it can cause a severe electron trapping. Uh, moreover, uh, if the carbon level goes above a certain threshold, it can, cause, uh, it can also flip the leakage versus the carbon trend. So if you see this uh, right figure, up to about 1 is 19 per cubic centimeter, the inclusion carbon is helpful for the breakdown voltage improvement. But with the if the carbon level goes above the above 1 in 19 or close to the 1 in 20, now the trend is flipped and we start to see the degradation of the leakage current. Uh, so the carbon level optimization is one of the key design parameters for high quality AP design. So once the back barrier growth is done, now the next step is the, the top heterostructure. structure. For gallium nitride channel, we typically don't do any doping to maximize electron mobility and also minimize the number of traps. And the gallium nitride channel is capped with the argon barrier. So the lattice constant of the argon barrier is smaller than the gallium nitride. So if you grow the aluminum gallium nitride on top of gallium nitride pseudomotically, the top argon barrier gets a tensile stress. And here, the polarization field that we discussed in the crystal structure part plays a very important role. So first, gall both gallium and aluminum gallium nitride have a spontaneous polarization field coming from the bullseye crystal structure. And on top of that, aluminum gallium nitride has a piezoelectric polarization caused by the strain. So if you draw the net polarization charges across the heterostructure, you can find that there is a very strong electric field in the argon barrier. And because of this high electric field, the surface donor states can be activated, and electrons coming out of the donor states can fall down to the gallium nitride following the electric field, and these electrons can be accumulated at argon gas interface. So these accumulated electrons are called as a two-dimensional electron gas, shortly to that and it is used as a main channel in GAN device. Since the origin of the two-deck channel is the polarization field in the argon barrier, the, its electron density is also determined by the argon barrier design. For example, by increasing the aluminum percent in the argon barrier, or by thickening the argon thickness, we can increase the two-deck density. 
So typical true-neck density level is about 1E13 uh, per square centimeter, which is pretty high. Uh, in, in addition to the high electron density, the electron mobility is also quite high. In the gallium nitride, uh, if you see this right figure, the gallium nitride bulk mobility is mainly limited by the impurity scattering. But in the case of the two-deck channel, thanks to the separation between the donor states and the two-deck channel, the impurity scattering is much less. So the electron mobility can be as high as about 2,000 at room temperature. So once the epigrowth is done, now we can fabricate the device on it. And this left figure shows a typical uh, GAN device structure. So first thing you can notice is that it's a lateral device. So current flows laterally through this two-deck channel. In the, GAN, in the GAN channel, there is no PN junction. So typically for a GAN device fabrication, people do not use the implantation for additional doping. Uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. First, the high electron mobility channel is formed automatically during the epigrowth. So there is no need to form additional uh, doped layer for electron supply. And also, even though you want to do additional doping with the implantation, it's quite challenging to activate the dopants and uh, cure the, the implantation damage. It requires about 12 to 13 degrees C annealing temperature, which can affect the overall epic quality and also other uh, process uh, conditions. Since there is no PN junction in the GAN, uh, in GAN device, which is used to block high voltage in conventional silicon power devices, the GAN device relies on multiple field flights for high electric field engineering. So in this device, you can find the three uh, field plates. So one gate-connected field plate and two source-connected field plates. And we're going to talk about these field plates a little more when we discuss the device operation. Lastly, the GAN device is a naturally depletion mode device. Since the two-deck channel is formed automatically during the epic growth, uh, the channel is formed under the gate without any gate bias. But in other words, to shut off the device, we need to apply negative gate voltage, which is actually not desirable for power devices because it raises concern for safety and device controllability. So to make a normally off or enhancement mode device, we need additional engineering in gate area. So there has been uh, extensive research to make uh, stable enhancement mode uh, GAN devices. So here we can review the three different approaches. The first one is the argon barrier recess. The origin of the two-deck channel is the collision field in the argon barrier. So by removing the argon barrier partially or completely under the gate, we can kill the two-deck under the gate and make an enhancement mode device. So this approach is most uh, straightforward, but there are a couple of process challenges. Uh, first, uh, threshold voltage can be dependent on the remaining argon barrier, but this control is not easy. It's a time gap. And also during this edge process, the mobility under the gate uh, can be degraded due to the plasma damage. Second approach is to introduce the negative I, uh, charges under the gate. For as an example, uh, you can expose the gate area to the flowing plasma and fluorine ions can be implanted in the argon barrier, and the negative charges uh, of the fluorine ions can deplete the two-deck channel under the gate. So this approach is interesting, but there also there is some concerns. So first, uh, the threshold voltage can be dependent on the amount of the fluorine ions implanted and activated in the argon barrier, which is relatively thin. And also, the, there is some concern about the stability of the implanted flowing ions during the high temperature process or long-term operation. The last approach is the PGAN on top of the argon barrier. So if you grow the PGAN on top of the argon barrier, now the entire gate structure is like a PN junction. So the, the built-in potential difference between the PGAN and the N-type channel can raise the band and it depletes the two-deck channel under the gate. So since uh, the PGAN, is, uh, PGAN growth is uh, done during the epic growth, uh, this approach can have a better threshold voltage controllability compared to the other approaches. And until now, the, this approach is winning. So most of the commercial NSM mode devices uh, use this PGAN gate structure. So here we can review the main device configurations in current GAN market. So both E mode and D mode are present. And these first two device configurations use the depletion mode again device, but users still need to take care of the negative VT issue. 
So in the first device configuration, depletion mode GAN device is connected to the silicon fat uh, in series uh, like a cascode, and entire chip is controlled by the silicon device whose VT is positive. Second, in the second configuration, the silicon gate driver is co-packaged uh, with the depletion mode GAN device, and this integrated gate driver generates the negative voltage and drives the depletion mode GAN device. The third one is a uh, uh, standalone enhancement mode device. And the fourth one is very similar to the second one, but the GAN device is enhancement mode. In the first or the third uh, configurations, the separate gate drivers are needed, while the, in the second and first options, the gate drivers are already integrated. So now we can check the device operation. So there are three main operation modes. So in the first one is the forward conduction mode, which is basically on state. So in the on state, the device own resistance is most important, which determines the conduction law. Second operation mode is a reverse conduction mode, which is also called as a, the third quadrant. So in this state, the gate source voltage is below threshold voltage, but the drain voltage goes to the negative value so the channel can be turned on because gate drain voltage is above threshold voltage. Since device is in saturation mode in the reverse conduction mode, the source drain voltage to flow the required switching current determines the conduction loss. In the off state, high voltage blocking, high voltage blocking is most important, obviously. So now we can check the inside of the GAN device in each operation mode. So to help your understanding, it is compared with uh, conventional vertical silicon power devices. First, in the forward conduction mode, there is nothing uh, uh, special. So in the uh, silicon device, the current flows vertically through the end drip and the inverted channel. In GAN device, current flows laterally through to this two deck channel. But there is a clear difference in the third quadrant or reverse conduction mode between these two devices. In the silicon power device, the first, uh, in the reverse conduction mode, channel is off, and as drain voltage goes to the negative value, the body diode between the P-body and end drip uh, turns on, so current flows through this body diode. So the current path between the forward conduction mode and the reverse conduction mode is uh, different. But in GAN device, there is no body diode. So now the drain voltage has to go to more negative values to turn on the channel. So once the gate drain voltage becomes above the threshold voltage, now the channel is on. So the current flows this two-deck channel again, but now the conduction direction is positive. Since the threshold voltage of the gallium nitride device is generally higher than the body diode ton on voltage, the conduction loss in the reverse conduction mode can be higher in the GAN device. So in GAN circuit design, it's important to minimize this uh, reverse conduction mode time to minimize the efficiency degradation. The way to block the high voltage in the off state is also different within these two devices. In the silicon power device, the P-body and N-drift is reverse biased, and this reverse PN bias PN junction is the way to block high voltage. But in GAN device, the high voltage blocking is done by these multiple field plates. So field plates are basically the multiple gates with the different negative threshold voltages. And these field plates are connected to the gate or source which are zero voltage in the off state. So if you see this right figure, uh, in the off state, first the uh, gate is off, so tenor, the electrons under the gate are depleted. And as the drain voltage increases, the potential difference between the first field plate and channel, which is the threshold voltage of the first field plate. So the electrons under the first field plate are depleted. So it's like a shutting of the gate. So once uh, this happens, now the high drain voltage cannot go into the inner device region and is blocked by this field plate until the next field plate effect kicks in. The next field plate has, uh, can block the higher voltage because it has a more negative threshold voltage because of the thicker dielectric film. So by putting multiple field plates in series, we can increase the maximum blocking voltage. And here, there is an important difference in electric, electric field distribution between these two devices. In silicon device, the high electric field is mainly handled inside of the silicon. But in GAN device, main electric field lines 
come out of the gallium nitride and go through the dielectric films. So because of that, the dielectric film reliability is very important in GAN devices, and we're going to see it in the following reliability section. So until now, we reviewed the basics of the GAN devices, and now uh, we're going to see what kinds of potential reliability issues can happen in this device. So we'll uh, first see the intrinsic device level, covering three important uh, topics, uh, TDDB, time-dependent dialect breakdown, the threshold voltage instability, and the dynamic RDS zone. So reliability is always the main concern for new devices. But every device has a failure mode. So this left figure uh, describes the main reliability issues in conventional silicon devices. Uh, the first one is the threshold voltage instability, which is also called as a BPI. The second one is a hot carrier effect. So hot carriers can be generated under high drain voltage and can damage the device through the impact organization. And also the trapping or dialect breakdown of gate oxide are also important uh, reliable issues in silicon MOSFET. And the GAN device is nothing different from silicon MOSFET. We are seeing pretty much a similar uh, failure modes in this device. In the gate area, the threshold voltage instability or the gate breakdown can happen. And also in the dielectric film or the gallium nitride FD, uh, the strong high, the high electric field from the drain can cause the electron trapping or breakdown issues. So what we need to do is to understand that these potential degradation modes and engineer the device and process properly to meet the required reliability uh, lifetime. So let's first check the time-dependent dielectric breakdown, shortly TDDB. So TDDB occurs in polar materials under high electric field. And the dielectric films used in the semiconductor process, such as the silicon oxide or silicon nitride, are polar materials. And as you reviewed in the crystal structure part, the gallium nitride also has a polar material property. So once these materials are exposed to the high electric field, the lattice gets strained and the defects can be formed. And once the defects form the percolation path along the field direction, so now the catastrophic dielectric breakdown can happen with a large leakage current. And the damage caused by the time-dependent dielectric breakdown is not recoverable. So in GAN device, there are a couple of reasons that we need to check the TDDB issue. First, in the on state, especially the in enhancement mode device, under positive gate voltage, the gate stack is uh, exposed to the vertical electric field. So we need to check the on state uh, gate TDDB. Uh, in the off state, more regions are exposed to the strong electric field because of the high drain voltage. For example, the dielectric film near the field plate and also the gallium nitride epi. So let's first check the on state gate TDB in the EMO device. For, the, for that, we need to understand this uh, gate structure. So if you see this uh, left figure, the P type gallium nitride doped with the magnesium is grown on top of the argon barrier and the gain metal is directly sit on the, the P-type gallium nitride. And depending on the contact property of the, this gain metal, the way that this gain structure operates can be changed. If the gain metal forms an ohmic contact to the P-gain, now this gain structure can be simplified as a series uh, connection of the resistor and heterojunction uh, PN diode. So under positive gate voltage, there is a negligible voltage drop in this resistor part, which is basically the peak and gate uh, junction, and most of the voltage is applied to this bottom heterojunction, junction, which is argon barrier. So in the ohmic contact-based uh, gate structure, the on-state gate TDB is mainly determined by the argon barrier reliability. On the other hand, if the gate metal forms a shocky contact to the peak end, now this gate structure becomes like a back-to-back -back connected uh, diodes. So under positive gate voltage, this uh, top junction becomes a reverse biased Schottky junction, while the bottom junction is forward biased. Since the voltage drop occurs in both of the regions, the maximum voltage we, that we can apply is higher in this Schottky contact-based uh, gate structure. And also, thanks to this reverse biased Schottky junction, the gate leakage current is much uh, lower in this Schottky contact uh, gate structure. So if you see the energy band diagram, uh, first and third, uh, zero gate bias, there is no electron at the argon gate interface, and the formula level is aligned to the magnesium level in the P-gap. 
So magnesium level is about 0.2 EV from the balance band. And this is about roughly about 10 times higher than the thermal energy at room temperature. So the, about 1% of the magnesium dopants can be activated in the, this quasi-neutral PGAN region. So typical PGAN doping level is about 1 in 19 per cubic centimeter. So effective hole density is about 1 in 17-ish. So once you apply the positive gate voltage, now first the gain metal and PGAN junction is a reverse bias. The holes in the top peak and junctions are depleted. And in this depletion region, uh, different from the quasi-neutral region, now almost 100% uh, magnesium dopants can be activated because of the, this energy band bending. So the surface electric field can be quite high. And holes coming from the depletion region are now accumulated at argon peak and interface. And these positive charges attract the electrons in the, on the other side and argon can interface. So this is how the two-deck channel is formed under the positive gate voltage. So as you can see in this band structure, the voltage drop occurs in top peak and junction as well as the argon barrier. So when we study the, the on-state gate TDD in the Schottky context-based uh, EMO device, both of the regions uh, need to be considered. So there has been uh, extensive uh, research to improve the on-state uh, gate TDD uh, in EMO device, especially the Schottky contact-based EMO device. And the most of the research here focused on the top Schottky junction because that's where high electric field exists and also the electron current or the leakage current is limited. So if you, here we can review the three different approaches. So first, the undoped gallium nitride is grown on top of the peak and layer. And thanks to the lower doping level, now the surface electric field is reduced. So the maximum gate voltage margin is improved by more than three volts, as you can see in this bottom figure. In the second approach, now the N-type uh, gallium nitride is grown on top of PGAN. So in this uh, structure, now top Schottky junction is changed to the PN junction. Generally, the PN junction can provide more uniform and a lower electric field than the Schottky junction. So the gate TDB lifetime is improved significantly with about few orders of magnitude uh, gate leakage current reduction. The last approach, the gallium oxygen nitride is formed by oxidizing the peak and surface. So gallium oxygen nitride has a slightly larger energy band gap and also the better material stability. So it can provide a better a longer TDB lifetime as well as a lower gate leakage as you can see in this figure. So now we can move to the off-state TDB issue. So in the off-state, so one of the key reasons that we need to think about is the dielectric films near the field plates. So if you see this figure, in the off-state, the electrons in the channel are depleted, which expose the positive polarization charges. So the electric field is formed between these positive charges and the field plate, and especially the electric field is very high near the field plate edge because of the field concentration. The TK simulation shown in this bottom figure also uh, confirms the high electric field in the field gate field plate edge. And this right figure shows the actual failure analysis of the device, which failed during the high voltage off state stress. So this is a gate, and you can also see the MET1 and MET2 field plate. And if you zoom in this gate area, you can clearly see that the failure started from the gate field plate edge. And the main field uh, failure direction is also aligned to the field direction. So to prevent this uh, dielectric film breakdown near the field plate, uh, we need to optimize the field plate and the epi. So in terms of the field plate design, uh, the, the transition from the one field plate to the next field plate uh, has to gradual enough to suppress any severe electric field crowding. And also we need to use the high quality dielectric film to maximize the dielectric film lifetime on the high electric field. And in terms of the epi design, two-deck density is uh, quite critical. So high two-deck density is good for device own resistance, but bad for TDDB. So when we design the heterostructure, these two competing factors has to be balanced. Another reason that we need to check the TDDB in the off state is the gallium nitride epi. In typical GAN device configuration, the substrate is grounded. So there is a vertical electric field between the top side drain channel and the substrate. So for example, if the 600 volt is applied to the drain and the gallium nitride epithickness is a two micro, 
the average electric field across the Ganepi is about three megavolt per centimeter. So this value is still lower than the critical electric field of the gallium nitride, which is about 3.4 megavolt per centimeter. So you may not see the instant device breakdown, but if you leave the device under this stress for enough time, the device will eventually fail before meeting the required reliability time. And this is because the gallium nitride also has the TDDB issue. So in other words, we cannot design the gallium nitride AP thickness just based on the critical electric field. So to find the, tar the appropriate AP thickness for target operation voltage, uh, we need the actual APTD modeling, and people typically use voltage or temperature acceleration. And this TDD gain gallium nitride APTD mechanism is one of the key factors to determine the maximum voltage capability of the GAN device. So in this aspect, we can think about the theoretical limit of the gallium nitride. So Balegas figure of merit is uh, widely used to uh, evaluate the potential of semiconductor materials, especially for power devices. And it's mainly determined by the mobility and the critical electric field. But in the case of the gallium nitride, uh, this uh, theoretical limit only reflects a time zero performance because gallium nitride has a TDDB issue. So in other words, the maximum electric field to meet the required reliability lifetime can be lower than the critical electric field. So it is very challenging to push the GAN device to this uh, theoretical limit. And this can need to be considered uh, in the actual device design. So now let me move to the second reliability issue, which is a threshold voltage instability. So let me start with the real basic. So this left figure shows a transfer curve. So the black curve is from the fresh device. So with on-state gate voltage, the on-current is high. And with off-state uh, gate voltage, the leakage current is low. So now let's see what happens there if there is a negative voltage shift, which is the red curve. We don't have any problem in, in the on-state. But in the off state, now the leakage current is increased significantly. So what's the problem in actual circuit? So if you see the typical half bridge circuit, and if you assume the high side bed is on and low side bed is off, and if there is a negative VT shift issue in the low side bed, now the low side bed cannot block the high voltage, so there can be a large leakage current, which can increase the conduction loss. And if it becomes serious, it can also cause a shoot through issue, and also it can cause a short circuit event which can damage the entire system. Then how about the positivity shift? So if you see the blue curve, now we don't have any problem in the off state, but now in the on state, now on current is reduced because of the reduction of the gate overdrive. So in the same circuit, now we have a problem in the high side bed because the increase, the increase of, in the device resistance can increase the conduction loss. So in the depletion mode device with the gate dielectric, the negative VT shift is the main concern. So if you see this left figure, the fresh device shows about minus two volt VT. But after a negative gate voltage stress, VT becomes more negative. So the longer, stay, uh, longer stress time makes the VT, uh, the amount of the VT shift uh, larger. And also it is accelerated by the higher temperature. And also high drain voltage can affect uh, this uh, negative VT shift. So if you see this right figure, after high, voltage, high drain voltage stress, the transfer curve is shifted from the red curve to the blue curve. So the multiple factors can trigger this negative VT shift. The gate or drain voltage stress, longer stress time, and higher temperature. So there has been uh, extensive research to understand this, uh, mechan the mechanism of this negative shift. So one possible explanation is the donor state at argon dielectric interface uh, can be activated under gate or drain voltage stress. And uh, this effect can provide a positive charge effect in this location, which attracts the more electrons at argon gun interface. So this can cause a negative VT shift. Another explanation is also related to donor states, but the location is not argon dielectric interface, but in the gallium nitride channel or in back barrier region. But similar to the, the do, surface donor state, once these donor states in the GAN channel are activated, uh, it provides the fixed positive charge effect, uh, which causes a negative VT shift. Lastly, the holes generated under high drain voltage stress can flow into the channel area following the electric field 
and get injected the, into the gate area and cause a negative weight shift. And this negative weight shift uh, is one of the key reasons why it's very challenging to make a stable enhancement mode operation with a gate dielectric. So in this uh, study, the tri-gate GAN devices were fabricated with two different gate structures. So in the first device, the aluminum oxide gate oxide, aluminum oxide was used as a gate oxide. So the gate structure is like a typical MIS structure. So in this device, especially at room temperature, the VT is quite positive thanks to this tri-gate structure. So although there is some hysteresis, VT is close to zero, so you can call it as effectively as an enhancement mode device. But if you go to the higher temperature and do the forward and reverse bias sweep, you can clearly see that there is a large negative weight shift. So even though at time zero, it can be called as an enhancement mode device, but after the stress, uh, it uh, becomes a depletion mode device. But now in the second device, this aluminum oxide was replaced by the P-type nickel oxide. Since this is a P-type oxide, now the gate structure is like a PN junction. And in this device, the negative weight shift is uh, significantly suppressed. And this data may explain why we are seeing more stable enhancement mode uh, operation with a PGAN based uh, gate structure and compared to the other enhancement mode approaches with a uh, gate dielectric. Now we can move to the, the threshold voltage instability in the E mode device. So E mode device gate structure is a little more complex than the D mode. So especially the, when the gate metal forms a shocky contact to the PGAN, the gate structure is like a back-to-back -back connected diode. And this can be modeled as a series and parallel connection of a voltage-dependent resistor and capacitors. So in the case of the top junction, it's a reverse bias shocky junction. So the resistance is determined by the reverse bias leakage current in this top shocky junction. And the capacitance is the top PGAN depletion capacitance. In the case of the bottom junction, the resistance is, uh, de is mainly determined by the forward bias current, and the capacitance is a series combination of the argon barrier capacitance and the gallium nitride depletion capacitance. And most importantly, this center node, which is the PGAN, is a kind of floating, and this can cause uh, various uh, dynamic effects. For example, if you do the transfer curve sweep with a very short course, the initial peak and potential can be affected by the pre-sweep condition. So if you see this bottom left figure, before the sweep, the positive gate pulse stress was applied. And the excessive holes accumulated in the peak and during this positive gate voltage stress affect the peak and potential and cause the early device turn off. So if you see this center figure compared to the transfer curve measured with the DC setup, the first transfer curve after the positive gate voltage stress shows more negative VT. But if you use a longer pulse or wait for enough time, the excessive holes in the peak end can be consumed and the gap between the pulse measurement and the DC measurement is reduced. So because of this dynamic effect, the amount of the VT shift can be also dependent on the measurement setup in this peak end gate structure. In addition to the pure dynamic effect, there is also trap-induced uh, VT shift. So this left figure monitors the threshold voltage as a function of a stress time under different gate voltage conditions. When gate voltage is uh, relatively low, we typically observe the positive VT shift, which is due to the electron trapping at argon gate interface. But if you increase the gate voltage further, we start to see the negative VT shift due to the hole trapping or the neutralization of magnesium dopants. In the case of the magnesium dopants, if you grow the PGAN on top of the argon barrier, the magnesium can diffuse into the argon barrier. So if you do the SIMS measurement after the growth, you can see the magnesium tail in the argon barrier. So magnesium in the argon barrier are activated because of the polarization uh, field in the argon barrier, and it can cause the more positive VT in the fresh device. But under positive gate voltage stress, the polarization field in the argon barrier is reduced, and a lot of holes can, get inject, can be injected into the argon barrier. And this effect uh, reduces the number of ionized magnesium concentration in the argon barrier, as you can see in this figure, and this can cause a negativity shift. 
the free T instability in the PGN gate also uh, is also observed after off state stress. So this research investigates the uh, free T shift after high voltage off state. So if you see this uh, left figure, first the devices were stressed in the high voltage off state, and they came back to the low voltage and transfer curves were measured. And after high voltage off state, the positive free T shift is observed as you can see in this figure and amount of the shift increases with increasing the off-state drain voltage. But what is uh, very interesting is amount of the VT shift shows a direct correlation to the charge image to the peak and gate in the, during the off-state. So what happens is during the off-state, this peak and, and the channel junction is a reverse bias. So holes in the peak and region uh, are depleted and they can escape the peak and through this uh, top shock junction. But once the device comes back to the low voltage state, now the holes uh, have to come back to the peak end, but it takes time because now they have to go through this reverse bias uh, shock junction. And this delay caused the hole deficiency in the peak end and caused the positive to shift. So as you can see in these uh, studies, the peak end gate can have a various uh, dynamic free shift behaviors and these effects need to be considered in the device design and also circuit design. Last but not least, the dynamic RDS zone is also a very important phenomenon in GAN device. I believe that uh, this dynamic RDS zone has been studied the most extensively among all other reliable issues in gallium nitride. So simply speaking, the dynamic RDS zone, so-called the crunk collapse, uh, is the RDS zone increases during switching operation. So device switches between on and off state, and after coming back from the off state, the on state resistance is degraded compared to the fresh device. But this degradation is not permanent. If you stop switching and wait for enough time, the most of our distance degradation can be recovered. The recovery time varies from some microseconds to a few tens of hours. So to capture the all the dynamic R distance effect, it is important to minimize the delay between the stress and measurement. So this right figure shows the dynamic RDS zone of uh, good and bad devices under high voltage switching. And the RDS zone was measured with less than one microsecond delay. So in the good device, the RDS zone drift is negligible, while in the bad device, RDS zone shoots up. So the RDS zone is increased by a few times. This can cause a severe conduction loss increase and also cause the additional cell feeding. So the cause of the dynamic RDS zone is the electron trapping under high electric field stress. In the, in the following slides, we're gonna review the couple of different electron trapping mechanisms in GAN device and what kinds of process improvement is needed to suppress them. So first the electron trapping mechanism is a leakage current induced surface trapping. So in GAN device, high voltage blocking is done by these multiple field plates and this means that these field plates are exposed to the high electric field. So electrons in the field plate can be ejected due to this high electric field and they can be trapped in the dielectric or dielectric argon interface. Especially the argon surface has uh, many donor states where the electrons can be trapped. And the gallium nitride does not have a uh, high quality native oxide which can passivate uh, these uh, surface states like a silicon oxide for silicon. So once the uh, many electrons are trapped in these uh, surface states, these electrons can de uh, deplete the two-deck channel and increase the device resistance. And also in the off state, these trapped electrons can increase the depletion uh, region and expand the, uh, push out the depletion region. And since this is a similar to the, similar to, similar that, that there is additional gate in this excess region, so it's also called as a virtual gate effect. So if this virtual gate effect is uh, severe, it can also change the electric field profile completely. So if you see this right figure, with a negligible electron trapping, the electric field uh, peak uh, is formed near the gate field plate edge, and most of the voltage drop also occurs in this region. But once a severe virtual gate effect happens, now the depletion region is expanding, and the electric field peak is now formed near the drain edge. So to suppress this surface trapping mechanism, we obviously need a high quality surface passivation technology. So there has been uh, various uh, studies on uh, uh, diverse dielectric films, such as uh, 
silicon nitride, silicon oxide, aluminum oxide, aluminum nitride, etc. But in current industries, uh, the silicon nitride or silicon oxide are mainly used to suppress this surface electric trapping mechanism. Another way to suppress this surface trapping is to reduce the electron supply. So as you reviewed in the previous slide, the main source of the electron is the leakage current caused by high electric field. So by reducing the electric field near the field plate edge, we can effectively suppress this process. For example, instead of using a single field plate, by using the multiple field plate, we can effectively reduce the electric field peak. So if you see this right figure, compared to the single field plate device, the dual field plate devices show much lower peak electric field and is also helpful for the dynamic RDS and performance improvement. But this uh, the field, plate, uh, techno field plate option is not free because uh, with the increasing the number of field plates, the process complexity increases, and also it can also affect the uh, switching performance because it increases the output capacitance. So when we design the field plate, multiple factors uh, need to be considered. Dielectric limited TDDB, the dynamic RDS zone, process complexity, and also the output capacitance. Another important electron trapping mechanism in, in the off state is the electron trapping inside of the gallium nitride FD. So as you reviewed in the TDB part, there is a vertical electric field between the drain side channel and the substrate. So electrons in the substrate can be uh, injected into the gallium nitride and they can be trapped. So stu to study this electron trapping mechanism, uh, the people typically use the backgating stress configuration. So to replicate the drain side region in the standard device in the off state, so now that you apply the negative substrate voltage with applying low voltage on top terminals. So in this case, the entire device is exposed to the vertical electric field. So the electron traffic in gallium nitride epi can be amplified. But at the same time, since we apply the low voltage on top terminals, we can exclude the surface trapping mechanism that we reviewed in the previous slide. So if you see the bottom figures, the dynamic RDS zone of the standard device shows a very similar temperature dependence to the backgating stress uh, data. This indicates that the dominant trapping mechanism in this device is the electron trapping in gallium nitride epi. And to suppress this uh, electron trapping in the epi, uh, the gross, epi gross condition optimization is uh, critical. For example, the, car the carbon level is optimization is uh, very critical for high quality epi design. And even in the same carbon level, the other gross conditions, such as the temperature or pressure, can affect the crystal quality. And also, similar to the surface trapping mechanism, we can also reduce the electron supply to the GAN FD. So by improving the aluminum nitride nucleation layer and also buffer layer, we can, reduce, we can suppress the electron injection into the gallium nitride FD. As a one uh, example, this right figure shows that there is a good correlation between the vertical leakage current in the off state and the dynamic RDS zone. So basically, the, by, by making the buffer more insulating, we can improve the dynamic RDS zone performance by suppressing this buffer trapping mechanism. Hot carrier injection is another important trapping mechanism in gallium nitride. So if there are channel electrons under high lateral electric field, these electrons get accelerated under high lateral electric field and these energy-free electrons can be trapped in the surface state or gallium nitride FD. So to study this hot carrier injection effect, a high voltage semi-ion state, state stress setup can be used. So if you see this center figure, the RDS zone was monitored as a function of stress time under high voltage semi-ion state stress. So with increasing the channel current from the 100 nanoamp to the 10 microamp, the RDS zone degradation is accelerated because uh, Higher channel current means that uh, higher number of uh, channel hot electrons. And this hot electron in, uh, effect has a negative temperature activation because the uh, increase in the lattice scattering at high temperature can suppress the hot electron generation. So if the dominant electron trapping mechanism is a hot carrier injection, the dynamic RDS and performance can be actually improved at higher temperature as you can see in this figure. 
But this high voltage semi-ion state uh, stress setup is useful to study the hot carrier injection effect. But since this is a DC setup, there is a several there are several limitations. For example, we cannot use a high voltage and high current at the same time because it can cause a severe self heating. So as another option, we can use a double pulse uh, measurement. So by controlling the gate and the drain bolt uh, signals uh, separately, we can create the overlap time. So during this overlap time, device turns on under high drain voltage. So during this overlap time, a lot of hot carriers can be generated, but we don't need to worry about the severe self feeding because this overlap time is very short. So this the study shown in the this center figure studies the impact of this overlap time on device uh, behavior. And if you see this uh, center figure, with the increasing this overlap time, the EL signal coming out of the device increases uh, because, of, because the, with the longer overlap time, the number of hot carriers increases. At the same time, the dynamic RDS performance is degraded because of the hot carrier injection mechanism. But in some other cases, you may see complete opposite case. So if you see this uh, right figure, now with the increasing this overlap time, the dynamic RDS or our crunk collapse performance is actually improved, uh, which is a completely opposite result to the research, uh, the data shown in this center figure. Uh, this is because the hot electrons also can cause the impact ionization and holes generated in the impact ionization can compensate the trapped electrons and improve the dynamic RDS and performance. So about a couple of years ago, the hybrid drain technology, which uses this whole compensation effect, was uh, published. So additional P-type gallium nitride contact was added in front of the ohmic drain contact. And the holes get injected from this additional contact, and these holes compensate the trapped electrons and improve the dynamic or distant performance. So if you see this right figure, Compared to the reference device structure, this hybrid drain device uh, structure shows much better RDS and stability at higher drain voltage. So we have reviewed a couple of different electron trapping mechanisms in GAN device. So although we reviewed each trapping mechanism separate, uh, mechanism in separately, but in real application, these mechanisms can interact with each other. For example, in the fresh device, the electric field peak is uh, formed near the field plate edge, uh, which is uh, similar to the ideal case. But with the increase, uh, with the severe electron trapping in the surface state or a gallium nitride effect, now the electric field profile can be changed and the depletion region can be pushed up. Once it becomes severe, now the local electric field spike can be formed near the drain edge. And because of this electric field spike, now the hot carrier injection effect can be accelerated. And this behavior is actually observed in actual measurement. So if you see this bottom figure, the, in the low voltage condition, the EL peak is uh, uh, observed near the field plate edge, which is uh, similar to the ideal case or the fresh device case. But with increasing the drain voltage, now the EL signal is pushed out. And it, if you go to the real high voltage, now the EL peak is mainly observed near the drain edge, which is similar to the, this last figure. So as you can see in this uh, example, the understanding each trapping mechanism and also understanding the interaction of these mechanisms can give us a clear and better picture of the device reliability in actual operation. So in the following section, we're gonna review the application re level reliability, which is more relevant to the real uses. Then how can we evaluate the application level reliability? One straightforward way is to stress devices in actual circuits. And the stress time should be long enough to guarantee a certain level of reliability. And there have been several publications which are aligned to this aspect. So in this left figure, the 40 volt GAN devices were stressed in the 8 to 1 converter circuits for 20,000 hours. Uh, during this evaluation, the maximum RDS zone degradation uh, was saturated at about 11% and uh, no device failed. In the right paper, now 650 volt GAN devices uh, were stressed uh, in the septic converter for 3,000 hours at 150 degrees C. And during this test, neither of uh, serious RDS zone degradation or the leakage current increase was observed. As another example, 
the efficiency of the gain converter circuit was monitored for 3,000 hours at 175 degrees C. And as you can see in this figure, the converter circuit shows uh, excellent uh, stability. So as you can see in these examples, the one obvious uh, way to validate the application level reliability is to build a circuit and uh, run a long-term test. But everybody uses different circuits and different, different bias conditions. Basically, there is no standard. Uh, related to this issue, one important question is whether there is any fundamental stress mode in actual applications, uh, which can be difficult to be covered in the device level test. And if yes, we need to understand the, the stress mode and develop more standard way to evaluate. So let's check the, what kinds of uh, stress modes exist in actual applications. So this left figure shows the typical half bridge circuit, and this right figure shows the device operation mode that we reviewed. So there are three operation modes, on state, off state, and the third quadrant. And during the switching between on and off state, either of a hard switching or the soft switching transition uh, is possible depending on circuit topologies and uh, controller circuit. So let's first check the high to low transition of this switching node. So initially, the high side set is on and the low side set is off. So the current flows from the V in to the inductor through the high side set. And now once the high side set turns off, the current through the high side set drops and then the switching node potential drops. So the VDS of the high side set increases. So during this transition, the high side set goes through this soft switching transition. So first the current drops and then drain voltage increases. In the case of the low side set, to, to maintain the inductor current, it goes through the, uh, it, uh, it starts from the off state and goes to the third quadrant. And once the device turns off, it goes to the on state. So in this high to low transition, there is no special stress mode, which is difficult to be covered in the device level test. Then let's uh, see now the low to high transition. So now the high side set is off and the low side set is on. So the inductor uh, current goes through the load and the low side set. So once the high side set turns on, the current starts to increase in the low high side set under high drain voltage. And once the, the soft sw uh, switching load potential goes up, now the VDS of the high side set decreases. So this, during this transition, the high side set goes through this hard switching transition. So under high drain voltage, current first increases and then drain voltage drops. And this hard switching transition is particularly stressful because both high electric field and high current coexist. So a lot of hot carriers can be generated during this hard switching transition. And also the high DIDT and DVDT of the GAN circuit can push this hard switching uh, uh, locus to the close to the SOA boundary. And since this hard switching transition occurs in, ma in many different circuit topologies, such as the boost converter, buck converter, and total pole PFC, uh, it can be regarded as a fundamental stress mode in actual applications. Then let's check whether the traditional device level qualification can cover this hard switching transition. So if you see this uh, table, there are th three main uh, device level reliability tests. So first, HDGB is for the on state, so HTRB is for the off state, and HTOL is for switching, but it does not require hard switching transition. And both academia and the industry recognize this gap and try to develop a test vehicle to evaluate the hard switching robustness. So in the first paper, the inductor and resistor loads were used to generate this hard switching transition. The second paper uses the pure inductive load switching. The third one uses the re resistor and the capacitor load to generate this hard switching transition. Although there are some differences in the circuit designs, the main purposes are all same. The introducing the hard switching stress on the test device to evalu evaluate the device robustness under this stress. And this slide shows the uh, usefulness of the hard switching test vehicle. So the devices shown in this slide all pass the traditional device level qualification, including the HDGB, HTRB, and HTOL without hard switching uh, uh, transition. And this device is now stressed with, by using this inductive load hard switching test vehicle. And only one device passed the, the criteria. 
So these production grade devices show the stable RDS zone over 1,000 hours under 40 volt hard switching at 150 degrees C. But other devices from type A or type B group showed a lot of variations in the RDS zone performance and also some of the devices uh, failed due to the SOA. And this data suggests that the traditional device level qualification does not guarantee the hard switching robustness. And these devices are also evaluated in actual half-bridge applications. And consistent to the hard switching test vehicle result, the production grade device showed excellent uh, stability over 1,000 hours, while the devices from the type A group showed the over temperature fault due to the severe RDS zone increase, and also device from the type B group also shows some drift in the efficiency. And this confirms that the hard switching test vehicle can be a good representation for the stress in real applications. In addition to the uh, effort to develop the hard switching test vehicle, there are several recent uh, studies to build a switching reliability model in gallium nitride. So in this paper, the multiple different, the impact of the multiple different factors such as the temperature and drain voltage and switching current were studied. And uh, this impact on the switching lifetime were implemented as a model, and by using this model, you can predict the device lifetime depending on the switching low cost. There is another paper uh, which proposed a general method to cover the different switching conditions. So as you can see in this left figure, the amount of the switching stress was calculated by using this formula, the product of the drain voltage, switching current, and the overlap time, and some acceleration factors. And by using this formula, the amount of the switching uh, energy, uh, amount of the switching stress was calculated in different switching conditions, and the uh, device lifetime uh, was projected. So based on all these efforts, the JAP 180.01 was published recently, which describes a standard way to evaluate the switching reliability in GAN devices. So there are two main categories. The first one is the switching acceleration life test, which is basically the device lifetime modeling under switching. So similar to the uh, previous papers, we need to use uh, some accelerations to understand the wear out mechanism and predict the device lifetime. The second one is the dynamic HTOL, which is very similar to the HTOL, but now the hard switching transition is required. So the maximum operation voltage and uh, current uh, is rec are recommended for 1,000 hours to demonstra demonstrate the stability of the device on the hard switching stress. So that was the reliability uh, in normal operation condition. But in actual applications, there is another area that we need to cover, which is the out of SO event. The external electric shock or some controller force can trigger the out of SO events. And the high DIDT and DVDT of GAN circuit can occasionally introduce the voltage or current surge stress. And power devices are required to survive under these out of SO events for a certain amount of the time. But uh, you may think that it might be more challenging for GAN devices to handle these out of SO events uh, because first, the lateral GAN device doesn't have uh, avalanche breakdown. So there is some concern for the robustness under the voltage surge. And also, the, the, high, the lateral device structure and the high current density uh, can limit the robustness under the short circuit event. So in the case of the robustness under the voltage surge, there has been concern due to the lack of avalanche, but in reality, uh, it is not a big problem. So different from the conventional silicon power devices whose voltage rating is determined based on the about 80%, defined as about 80% of the actual breakdown voltage, the GAN device breakdown voltage is much higher than the target operation voltage. So the properly designed GAN devices can handle the voltage surge stress without causing any serious issues. So if this paper studies the, six, the robustness of the 600 volt GAN device under 720 volt surge stress. So if you see this uh, top right figure, the GAN devices were stressed under 400 volt input voltage and this input voltage was suddenly increased from 400 volt to the 720 volt. 
But GAN devices are switched under this 720 volt surge event without any problem. And even after 50 strikes, there was no change in efficiency. However, some weakness under the short circuit event was observed, especially in the standalone uh, GAN device. When the stress voltage is relatively low, the devices show the excellent stability. But if you go to higher voltage, the short circuit withstand time was uh, less than 10 microseconds, which is actually worse than typical silicon power devices or silicon carbide devices. So in this aspect, the system level uh, reliability is very important in the gallium nitride. For example, the integrated gate driver solution can provide a multiple smart gate function, such as a fast over temperature or overcurrent detection, and uh, it can prevent the potential reliability issues, such as a short circuit, and provide a more stable uh, and a complete uh, solution. So uh, we have reviewed the uh, various aspects of the reliability in the GAN devices. And uh, understanding these potential reliability issues and uh, underlying mechanisms allow us to define the design space and uh, push the device performance with uh, meeting the required reliability. So at the initial stage of the technology development, the meeting the reliability is the main goal. But, but with the now, with the successful technology qualification and commercialization, people start to focus more on expanding the potential of this technology. So in the last section, uh, we'll switch gears and uh, review the recent innovations which can push this GAN technology to the next level. So one path to expand the potential of the GAN technology uh, is to increase the integration level. By integrating the gate driver with the main power fed, we can remove the parasitic inductance in the gate loop and improve the switching performance. So initially, it was done by co-packaging the silicon gate driver uh, with a gallium nitride power device. But now it's moving toward the on-chip integration, which builds the, both the gate driver and the power device on the same gallium nitride chip. And there has been successful commercialization with this approach. And for the gate driver design with the gallium nitride, the DCFL, uh, is, uh, which uses uh, depletion mode NFAT and uh, enhancement mode NFAT, is mainly used. But to use a conventional CMOS circuit, we need uh, enhancement mode PFAT. Although there are still many technical challenges uh, to make a good enhancement mode PFAT, such as uh, low hole mobility or poor contact resistance, there has been good progress in this area. So if you see this right figure, so by using the peak and reason of the gate stack in the conventional E-mode power device, low voltage PFAT was fabricated. To push the VT, the recessed gate structure was used, and uh, to increase the gate voltage, uh, threshold voltage further, the undoped uh, gallium nitride or some plasma treatments uh, were applied. And as you can see in the right figures, the decent device performance and the the uh, initial the inverter operation was successfully demonstrated. Another uh, path to, in to increase the integration level in the GAN technology is in power loop. Since the GAN device is a lateral device, we can build the high side and low side set on the same chip. But there's uh, one problem. So if you put the high side and low side sets on the same chip, now they share the the same buffer and the substrate. And in GAN technology, there is no pure inner isolation. So in the half bridge operation, once the high side fed is on, the high side fed channel potential goes up, and there is a vertical electric field between the high side fed channel and the substrate, uh, which depletes the two deck channel in the high side fed. So this can cause the, the increase in conduction loss of the high side fed. So to solve this problem, the monolithic integration on SOI wafer was demonstrated. So here, now the high side fed and low side fats were built on the SOI wafer, and the top silicon uh, was isolated by using this deep trench edge. So in this technology, effectively, the high side and low side fats are sitting on different substrates. So this approach is quite interesting, and I think it's uh, innovative, but there are still uh, some room for additional improvement. For example, uh, 
The process complexity can increase in this approach uh, because of the SY wafer and this deep trench etch. And also, the, there can be a, some thermal limitation because of the poor thermal conductivity of the buried oxide. So if you go to one step further in terms of the integration level, now we can build everything that we mentioned before into on the single chip. So if you see this figure, the gate driver, high side bed, and low side bed uh, were integrated on a single gallium nitride chip. And this can provide the best form factor and also maximize the switching performance. In addition to, the, in addition to increasing the integration level, we can also add more functionality by adding the in-situ sensing capability. For example, by adding the two-deck register in the middle of the power fat, we can use it as a temperature sensor. And it can provide a fast uh, over-temperature detection function. Similarly, now the sense fat can be integrated in the middle of power fat by sharing the gate and the source nodes with the main fat. And by using the sense fat current, we can estimate the power fat current uh, and uh, this can be used uh, for the zero current or overcurrent detection, which can improve the safety and efficiency of the entire system. And also there has been continuous uh, research uh, on the new uh, gallium nitride device structure. So similar to the silicon, 3D uh, structure can provide additional freedom to improve the device performance in gallium nitride. As a, for example, the, by stacking the heterostructures, multiple two-deck channels can be formed, as you can see in this figure. And to control these multiple channels, the tri-gate and the 3D field plate concept were demonstrated, as you can see in this figure. And thanks to the multiple channels, the, this device uh, shows a much better RSP uh, with them meeting the same breakdown voltage requirement. So this is uh, one good example uh, to show the new device structure can push the GAN, te GAN technology performance significant, significantly. Lastly, there has been continuous effort to scale up the gallium nitride uh, wafers. In current GAN industry, either of 6-inch or 8-inch GAN wafers are used. But about two years ago, uh, in this conference, 12-inch GAN on silicon uh, technology was uh, published. Although it was mainly for the RF applications, which requires a relatively thin buffer, the excellent two-deck uniformity across, across the 12-inch wafer shows the potential of the gallium nitride wafer scaling. I think that brings me to the summary of this tutorial. So the GAN technology is not the future technology anymore. So fast and widespread market adoption is happening. And it has, it's, uh, it's possible, thanks to the extensive research, to understand the potential reliability issues and underlying me uh, reliability mechanisms. And also, there has been continuous effort to demonstrate the robustness of this technology by setting out new standards, such as uh, switching reliability. And with the continuous uh, improvement in the reliability, the GAN technology is evolving in multiple directions in both the device and system level. And it's expected that this GAN technology can uh, push the power electronics to the next uh, level and open up the new area. Uh, before finishing with this uh, talk, I'd like to thank uh, TI GAN development team. And uh, I think that's pretty much of it. Uh, thank you very much for all your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice talk. Uh, again, we have some time here. Uh, for some questions, if you come, please uh, go to the microphone, state name and affiliation, and then, yeah, it's open for questions. So thank you for a very nice talk. I'm Takuya Maeda from Cornell. So, so would you please comment on the TDDB issue in gamma nitride on gamma nitride vertical devices? So as you know, in vertical gamma nitride devices, the recently the uh, clear avalanche breakdown is achieved from the many groups. But uh, in your presentation, so you mentioned about the time-dependent direct breakdown uh, limits the device performance of the gamma silicon lateral devices. Would you please comment on these issues for gamma vertical devices? 
Yes, so this presentation is mainly for the lab chart again yeah, devices, yeah. Uh, which the, the, in this device we don't see the avalanche breakdown, but as you mentioned, the, the vertical GAN power devices, you, you can build a PN junction and uh, you can actually see the avalanche breakdown. And in that case, now you need to think about the both PDDB issue and avalanche breakdown. So in the case, in some voltage, you may not see the avalanche breakdown because uh, the voltage is not uh, reached the critical electric field. But still, the device can fail in the depletion region because of the TDDB issue. Mm -hmm. So the actual maximum operation voltage can be limited by actual TDDB, not the avalanche breakdown, also in the logical devices. And I think this can be a good uh, research area. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? So, uh, hello, my name is Latan Stanovic from uh, Global Ticket Solutions. Um, maybe uh, if you could comment, because it was not entirely clear to me, for all the for all the different uh, reliability mechanisms, uh, TDB, BTI, uh, um, BTI, PBTI, hot carrier, which ones? Uh, 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 for which one has been some recovery observed and which ones are permanent? So in the case of TDDB, it's a permanent. So once the TDDB happens, uh, uh, you cannot uh, recover that damage. But in the case of the dynamic RDS zone, it's recoverable. So if you stop switching and uh, leave the device, the electron trapping, the electrons trapped in the, the trap uh, site can be detrapped and the, the RDS zone can be recovered. Uh, also, the threshold voltage instability also can be recovered. So it's, uh, of course, uh, it actually it depends. So if the stress voltage is relatively low, the most of the threshold voltage uh, shift can be recovered. But if you go to the, go, if the stress voltage is goes above a certain level, you can start to introduce some permanent damage. And you can see that actual, the, the semi-permanent shift in the pre, uh, threshold voltage. Did I answer your question? Thank you for the very interesting talk. Uh, you said one of the challenges about PFET is uh, related to contact resistivity. Uh, is it related to the, the fact that the channel is an adult? And uh, if yes, is there a way to uh, overcome this challenge? Can you comment on this? Yes, so so one, one of the big challenges is the, the main uh, dopant in the PGAN is the magnesium. And the uh, magnesium level is relatively high. So it's, as I mentioned before, uh, in the slide, if, even though you doped, uh, for example, one in 19 uh, level, actual hole density is pretty low. So if you make the contact on this PGAN, the barrier height, uh, the, the tunneling width can be quite high because of the effect of lower doping level, so which caused the uh, high contact resistance. So I think uh, I don't remember the exact matter, but there is a certain kind of matter which can provide a relatively good contact resistance for the P-type gallium, uh, P -type gallium nitride. But now the main challenge is the integration with the main power fat. Hi, uh, Michael Hunt from IME. Um, just now you mentioned about a whole bunch of this uh, instability in GAN uh, about traps. Was there a systematic study of the traps in, in GAN? Like, oh. what are the traps? Is it intrinsic traps, extrinsic traps? Uh, what are the trap energy levels? Has there been a systematic study? Yes, so there are a lot of studies on the trap levels. And for example, the 0.9EB, 0.3EB kind of uh, traps are widely, me uh, widely measured on the gallium nitride, especially for the, the dynamic RDS zone or VT instability. And, but at the same time, uh, you may see the different trap levels uh, depending on how you measure mm -hmm. and how you grow the FE. So that's the, one of the key challenges, how to manage the, these uh, traps uh, in the gallium nitride. And also, even though there are traps uh, we need to uh, control and, uh, and also if, you, if the formal level is not close to that, for, that trap level, it's not effective, so it, which does not actually impact on device performance. So that's another way to handle these uh, trap issues in the gallium nitride. So then, then how do you minimize, I mean, if you can't, really don't understand 
what type of traps are present, then how do you suppress it? Yeah, for example, the, it's, it, when I uh, mentioned about the gallium nitride epigrowth, mm -hmm. carbon is, uh, is used to uh, make an insulating buffer. But actually, the, if you increase the carbon level, it can degrade the crystal quality. Mm -hmm. And uh, previously, the carbon doping is mainly done by the, the in-situ doping, which means that if you lower the gross temperature of the gallium nitride, the carbon is automatically doped through the, the carrier gas. But since uh, but to increase the carbon level, you need to use the lower gross temperature, mm -hmm. which can cause a degradation of the crystal quality and cause a lot of trap. Yes. So now the people start to use the, the external source for the carbon. So now you have an external carbon source, so you can increase the gross temperature to maintain the high quality gallium nitride and uh, you are controlling the carbon level by using the dose of the external source. So this is a one way to optimize the crystal quality and also maintain the, the device structure that the device designers want to. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Patrick Abinzon from Benek. Uh, thank you for your talk, very comprehensive. Just general question, you didn't detail the enhanced um, the two uh, enhancement modes, so you focused on peak and gate. Um, how do you compare the recessed misempt and peak and gate in terms of reliability and also integration, like when you have all these different functions you want to make? Yes, so the reason why I focused the uh, peak and based uh, EMO device in this uh, presentation is the is most of the commercial GAN device, EMO GAN devices adopt uh, peak and gate. Of course, there are also active research on other approaches. Uh, for example, the recessed gate structure has uh, various advantages uh, in terms of device performance because in the peak and gate structure, to make a threshold voltage positive, you need to reduce the two deck density, uh, which uh, degrades the own resistance. But in the case of the recessed gate structure, you can maintain the same two deck density in the excess region. So there is a definitely benefit in the device uh, RDS dot. Again, the problem is, uh, again, the, the stability of the threshold voltage and controllability. So when you do the recess for to make a threshold voltage positive, the, it can degrade the two deck mobility under the gate. And now, the, now you need to think about whether this is uh, beneficial for the entire device resistance, because even though you can increase, you can get better access, resist, access region resistance, but you are degrading the resistance in the channel region. Now, another challenge in the recess gate structure is, uh, as I mentioned this, uh, in the slide, the threshold voltage instability. So even though you can achieve the positive VT at time zero, but after high voltage stress, the VT can be shifted and uh, the big device can become the depletion mode device. So this, uh, these kind of real life issues need to be handled in the other approaches. So maybe less mature, maybe. <laughs> 